There's a whole underappreciated subcategory of bad movies. Ones that are too good to be good bad and too bad to be flat out good. They sit in this weird middle ground of shoddiness and compelling storytelling. A car crash, but a beautiful car crash with a pretty rad explosion. I call these golden retriever movies. They're big, dumb, happy, and don't ask too much from you in return. Some of them are enormous. For instance, anything that both A stars Vin Diesel and B isn't a Fast and Furious movie. And some of them, well, some of them are the first films of direct-to-video schlock wunderkinds that make you reconsider what you've done with your life. Time Chasers is exactly that second kind of movie. It's not quite transcendently awful, though it's been mocked by MST3K and Riff Tracks at this point, and quite hilariously. But it's also wildly ambitious for a cheaply made movie made in rural Vermont by a 24-year-old who mostly only had experience shooting local commercials. It shows so much competence in its understanding of genre, action, and pacing, even if it can't get, you know, acting, dialogue, or cinematography down all that well. It's also achingly earnest in the way that the best bad movies tend to be, and it fights handily against the limitations of its own tiny budget. It's the kind of movie that knows it's a little bit shabby and will take any of your jokes about it with a smile, confident in the knowledge that it was a labor of love to make and a delight to experience. So, my dear Castleton snobs, in no particular order, here are five things I love about Time Chasers. For a movie so universally maligned, the story of Time Chasers is surprisingly rock-solid when you look at it from 20,000 feet. Scientists build a time travel machine, a corporation wants to use said time travel machine for their own nefarious purposes, and the scientist has to fight to get control of his own invention back before it's too late, and time itself is ripped asunder! It scans. It tracks. It's not needlessly convoluted or overly simplistic. With the help of a veteran Hollywood script doctor, a more polished director, and about let's say $30 million, this could have been a quote-unquote real movie that you probably would have forgotten about the moment you left the theater. But for what it is, it's really fun. The characters are all well-defined, if a bit tropey. You've got your all-American scientist action hero, your plucky reporter love interest, your evil corporate suit, your well-meaning but conflicted comic relief lackey, your other well-meaning and less conflicted comic relief lackey, and your racist wildcard cab driver, like you do. Thematically, the film pays off as well. It's a simple science fiction techno hubris, man's reach exceeds his grasp thing, but with a healthy dollop of 80s and 90s corporate mistrust. It understands the conventions of science fiction and time travel, and honestly, has a pretty decent hand on it in a Back to the Future sort of way. Don't think too hard about the last act in the Revolutionary War times with all the plane wreckage and modern handguns they're leaving behind, though. The ending, I think it erases all that. Time travel is hard and fake. There's a general sense of causality and purpose to things in a way that doesn't show up in a lot of these MST3K Z-list movies. In a way, featuring this film on the show did it a billion favors in terms of notoriety, but may have done untold damage in terms of credibility. As a calling card, this thing just screams, give me more money to do something for real next time. Time Chasers is wildly ambitious. It's a time travel thriller with air sea chases, car crashes, plane crashes, revolutionary war fighters, blasted post-apocalyptic cityscapes, and utopian food courts. It's the kind of movie you doodle and sketch out in the margins of your notebook during the more incomprehensible parts of high school biology class somehow manifested onto the big screen. The film starts immediately with a gloriously simple and ingenious video feedback effect to simulate time travel, and then a wild Cessna appears! That's right, this movie had at least two planes. One to fly in the scenes, and another to film the first one. A teenager funded this and then made it happen! This is a movie that sprawls through several different timelines, alternate presents and futures, and manages to do it all for under $150,000. The film is a feature-length exercise in the willing suspension of disbelief. It knows that it doesn't have the sheer capital to pull off its biggest ideas flawlessly, but it's gonna try to entertain you as best as it can if you can meet it halfway. A lot of that ambition comes down to the oddly sophisticated savvy of David Giancola. I came into this thinking he'd be a Tommy Wiseau type, an artist falsely convinced of his prowess and skills making and defending a movie he wasn't skilled enough to handle, a person of hubris. But what I found was very much not that. John Cola seems to understand the kind of movie he made and the kind of movies he still makes. He settled into a really specific niche of spirited direct-to-video movies, and that's admirable. He makes some jobs in his hometown, he comes in under budget, and most of the time, everybody who puts money into the movie gets their money back and then some. He also gets to work with some pretty fun actors on the way up or on the way down. 
For instance, in Icebreaker, he worked with Sean Astin in his last role before he got the part in Lord of the Rings. It also features a sort of odd mid-career turn for Bruce Campbell, where he plays a dying terrorist who's got a bald head. John Kolob makes an honest living doing a thing he loves to do. Those of us with ambitions of filmmaking like to imagine ourselves as moguls. We all want to be Spielberg, or if you're me, you wanted to be Kevin Smith, which, while not necessarily a bad fate, wasn't like the most ambitious dream, Corey. But for the most part, almost every director winds up in sort of the David John Cola zone, trying to get things made, having a little idea you're passionate about, or at the very least, having a little idea you know you can produce. Not making life-changing, world-changing art, but entertainment that makes you happy and gives people solid work. There's something to respect there. I have a lot of affection for David John Cola, even if I don't love a lot of the movies he's made after Time Chasers, I sort of envy the success he's found in his niche. Matthew Brew is not your typical leading man, or at least, not unless you squint a little bit. He's got a face that looks like you took Bruce Campbell's chin and glued it haphazardly onto Clark Gregg's stunt double, a t-shirt advertising Castleton University that's now a collector's item amongst enthusiasts, and a glorious Mel Gibson and Lethal Weapon mullet. As our hero Nick Miller, he's pitched as both a man of science and a man of action, and that fundamentally incompatible juxtaposition mixed with Brew's unpolished but naive charisma makes him deeply, deeply silly. Deeply, deeply endearing. He's the kind of mad inventor that's totally willing to experiment on himself for the good of science, and also completely willing to lie to everybody to trick them into getting on his gloriously dangerous time Cessna because otherwise they'd never believe him. There's a conviction and puckish charm to him that mixes with the weird 90s dad energy and crafts a strangely compelling power fantasy of a lead. The blathering professor explaining the concept of tangents and time travel in a utopian future food court that feels an awful lot like, you know, just a regular food court, almost seamlessly becomes a vague approximation of an action star when you throw him into a foot chase, or a bike chase, or a land air sea chase, or a car chase that almost immediately becomes the aforementioned bike chase because he can't drive even though he knows how to fly an airplane and pilot a boat, while his romantic chemistry with Lisa is tenuous at best and sometimes kind of uncomfortable, he's still an affable and welcome force for good in the movie, and Bruce seems to be having the time of his life. He's delightful. If I mention this whole movie is delightful. Now that I mention it, everybody seems to be having a ball in this movie. The supporting cast is a big, silly stack of ham, with every character delivering lines like it's their one shot at stardom, and it just works. Of the main supporting characters, Lisa and Matt, the romantic interest, and Gen Corp Stooge, respectively, are both kind of stiff, but they sell the wilder sci-fi complications with a lot of panache. Lisa, as portrayed by Bonnie Pritchard, is pretty great for a movie like this. Of the main cast, her performance may not be the strongest or most memorable, but she gets a lot to do. She gets in good offense in the fight scene, she has a fun horror angle with her time travel double's death, and she gets a great scene where she has to distract the people in air traffic control by pretending to be in a plane where the pilots had a heart attack. We also get not one, not two, but three comic relief characters in this one, and they're all varying levels of adorable. Peter Harrington plays the Gin Corp stooge Matthew Paul with a lot of weird, sad pathos and really hones in on that beaten down goon role where he doesn't really approve of anything the villain's doing, but he's also kind of a doormat and goes along with the evil plan right until it's too late. His salmon suit is legendary. Martin Juji plays Marty, the guy who works at the airfield. This marks the only time a character named Marty has ever appeared in a time travel movie. Strong Bill and Ted vibes here. He's kind of goofy in a shaggy way and disappears near the end of the movie because the actor had other things to do that day, so they just had to kind of write him out mid-scene. Guns being shot! You go play with the guns and the Uzis and the bullets flying at your head. That's what you want. And I'll be right over here, relaxing. You done? Come back and get me. Fine, fine. You're on your own. Before we get to the last comic relief character, we can't forget the generic corporate villain. J.K. Robertson is played by George Woodward, and he swings wildly between UHF Spatula City CEO energy. Hello, this is Cy Greenbloom, president of Spatula City. I like their spatula so much, I bought the company. And wild-eyed murder rampage businessman. I prefer the latter. I appreciate how eager the character is to get himself involved in the direct evil action of it all. Even after the whole time travel project has apparently been handed over to the federal government, it just shows a lot of initiative, you know? Sometimes you just need to take a time Cessna and an Uzi out yourself so you can drop off a couple of meddling do-gooders in Revolutionary War times. 
He also gets a rad death scene. Connect me to this. Finally, the piece de resistance. A veritable dagwood of a ham sandwich known only as Cappy. Michael J. Valentine has appeared in four of David John Cole's movies, and it's easy to tell why. He's a wild card. Strange, strange energy. Not to reference UHF twice in a row, but he feels like a poor man's Michael Richards playing Stanley Spadowski, and I'm here for it. The other bit players are also delightfully awful as well. You've got a strange, hectoring woman at the grocery store, a mealy-mouthed gate guard at the airfield who keeps saying gubmit instead of government, a skydiving granny, a lot of pseudo-Terminator blasted future folk, and revolutionary war reenactors turned actors trying to wrap their heads around dialogue. The whole cast is a glorious menagerie of spirited amateurs trying their best in a way that feels a lot like local community theater, for better or worse. The worst bad movies are self-serious. The best are unintentionally hilarious. Time Chasers is neither. It's got jokes. Not A-tier jokes, but jokes. And they're funny for the most part. Part of the joy of this movie is how airy the tone is. It's never too dour or lost in the weeds with its plotting or characterization, and it knows that it's playing pretty broadly with most of its material, so it's not afraid to resort to physical comedy to get a laugh. It's just a silly good time. Here's a little amuse-bouche of Time Chasers' affably goofy moments. drive. Citizens, the Church of the Holy Hologram needs your cash now. Mrs. Hines, how are you? Oh, I'll survive, and look at you, look how thin you are. I told your mother you're going to get too thin. <laughs> That's because I haven't had any of your good home cooking in but a while. You can always come to my house, but you never do. And I'm not getting any younger anymore either, and it's your fault. You work too hard. Mr. Hines. You're such a nice, young, handsome man. You need a young lady to help you out. Would you excuse me for just a moment? All right, all right. I'm, I'm going, but you be good. I'd like to present you with Gilda Heinz, star of the new GenCore television commercials, 80 years old and a world-class skydiver. You should try restricting you, some animals. Sir, can't you diet, read? You know, this is government installation. Out, okay? Hey, 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 who the hey. hell do you think you're talking to? I come sir, from this New is York, government New York. Installation. I don't care. Don't from Baltimore, and second, sir. Oh, I just drove here from Boston. I don't ben care, sir. This is government installation. I don't give you an you leave, sir. passion I sir, feel for this leave. particular dessert. Sir, now look! I don't think you fully understand what I'm trying to tell you. You need backup. Right at the front gate, we have some nut here. Right now, I'd kill for some chunky monkey. Sometimes, watching and making fun of bad movies can feel mean-spirited at best. At worst, it can be downright cruel. MST3K and its ilk walk an exceptionally fine line, and most of the time they come out without feeling too acrid because their own overly ambitious joy and DIY sensibilities get mixed with the venom, and it all goes down more or less smooth. But Time Chasers needs no such kid gloves. It revels in its own flaws, sticks a bow on them, and points excitedly at the bow, hoping you notice too. It's fun with friends, it's fun by yourself, it's fun in the old MST3K episode, and it's fun in the newer live riff tracks that's on Amazon Prime right now. Apparently a new digitally remastered cut of the film is coming to Blu-ray this year, and that'll be welcome because this DVD is basically the worst. It's that kind of particularly unforgivable DVD from the way way back where they didn't get the anamorphic bits right so it's letterboxed and pillarboxed on modern TVs, so it's like watching a weird little postage stamp in the center of your screen and you gotta stretch it. That being said, it's surprisingly packed with special features so it's kind of a toss-up. However, the only way to get it is if you want to buy it directly from David John Cola. No streaming yet. Regardless, track down Time Chasers in some form, watch it, and believe. Believe that you can make a movie, or whatever it is you want to make. Believe that your ambition is achievable, and that even if you don't have all of the skills you need to succeed, you can at least give it your best try. Maybe it'll be amazing. Maybe it'll be terrible. Maybe, like Time Chasers, it'll be both. Thank you all for watching Too Many Tapes. Please like this video, subscribe to my channel, I'm inching closer to a thousand subscribers, and hit the bell icon to get updates for when I upload new videos. 
What did you think of Time Chasers? Are you David Jonkola? Please talk to me. Let me know in the comments. If you want to help out a small YouTube creator, consider donating a dollar or more to my Patreon. I put every single cent I make off my Patreon into the show, so if you like what I do, it is the absolute best way to help me make more of it. The link is in the description. If you donate 20 or more dollars a month, you are a true Castleton snob, and you get to have your name in the credits in an enormous font like Chase Smith. You can also be like Nato Kitsch and have your name in an enormous font too. And drumroll please, you can also be like Mippa, my brand new and very mysterious $20 patron. It's your first video up here, so thank you for your support, Mippa. For $10 or more a month, you're a member in good standing of the Church of the Holy Hologram, and your name gets to be pretty big in the credits too. And for $5 a month, you're a time-traveling Cessna because somehow you managed to get early access to my videos. Thank you all again for watching, and I'll see you next time on Too Many Tapes. The film starts immediately with a gloriously simple and ingenious video, 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 video.